Hey, good morning. My name's Jason Zeiler. I'm going to be talking today about breaking boundaries and advanced cooling, the technologies in the future that HP and kind of other groups in the industry are looking at. I am the liquid cooling product manager and also the product manager for next generation infrastructure. So how we're planning for the future from exascale down to enterprise and everything in between. So I'm going to level set, kind of talk right at the beginning. A thing we always talk about is expectations for energy usage, what's happening in the data center. We always like to jump back to 2006 when the EPA released a report essentially saying power was going to be rising at a dramatic pace that was really going to be kind of setting off the alarm bells for the DOE, you know, anyone who generates power, they were looking at data centers saying this is going to be the major consumption um, kind of users around the globe. And even today you hear a lot of that in the news. And the line, the trend line was really showing some alarming rates. Data centers were going to have some runaway alarm usage and we were going to have to do something about it. Now the nice thing is when we jump ahead to 2016, 10 years later, we were able to see that that trend line really plateaued, it flattened out. And this was the result of really two driving factors. One was multi-core technology. There was a lot of innovation happening at the chip level to reduce the energy usage so that we were able to produce much more energy efficient chips and not, not have to have kind of runaway power issues in the, in the data center in the same way. But data center innovation itself was also happening. More innovation around in-row coolers, free cooling, adiabatic cooling. Um, there was a lot of changing happening in the data center. Now, where we are today, it looks very similar to that kind of plateaued line, you know, around 2006, but there is a major change happening in the data center today. And it's this yellow line that I'm about to show with the power war trend. So again, we see 2000 to 2010, we were at that single core te uh, te technology, multi-core from 2011 to 2017. But where we're going today is much different. The power war trend. Our friends at AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, there are some amazing new products coming out, but there are some power implications that we are seeing. And this is something we talk about, again, you see it in the headlines with exascale technology, very high-end supercomputers, but this is also an important issue for everything at enterprise. One or two servers inside of a rack can also generate a tremendous amount of heat. We're gonna talk a bit about that. So the, when we talk specifically around, I would say GPU and CPU power, in today, and I would say even last generation of chip technology, a high-end CPU might be around the kind of 200, 250 watt range. That would be kind of high TDP processors. Next generation, we're gonna see CPUs beyond 500 watts. GPUs, today, kind of a 500, 700 watt max, we're gonna see GPUs in the next five years exceed 1,000 watts. Now, that itself is not a major surprise. TDP has been increasing at a pretty steady rate for the last decade. But one thing that is changing is how the chips are being designed. Again, some amazing technology that is going into these chips is increasing the importance for cooling and decreasing their thermal, uh, I would say, uh, resistance. And so the line I show here, the silicon temperature of the T case, in, in really layman's, this is the maximum thermal temperature that these CPUs and GPUs can withstand. So today, I would say a pretty typical T case might be around 95 Celsius. A CPU can get very hot and still run. Nothing blows up, everything runs very smoothly. In next generation technology, there are going to be some chips, not everything, but there are going to be a lot of chips that are going to have a much lower T case. I've seen T cases as low as 55 Celsius. So a 40 degree drop is significant. So if you can you know, do some quick napkin math, imagine in the data center today, air-cooled data center purely, so let's say the facility air temperature is 30 Celsius, maybe let's say 25 Celsius. If the T case before was 90, that's an enormous gap between those two temperatures where the CPU could get pretty hot, do you need that efficient cooling technology? Maybe not. But if the T case is 55 to 60, that gap is much more narrow. We need much more effective cooling in order to capture the heat and bring it away. And so that's why I kind of built this, this box, unsustainable with air cooling. There's a lot of technology that is going to be, I would say, possible to cool with air cooling, but is going to be very difficult and is going to be very expensive. So today's talk is really about liquid cooling. And this is kind of where we really want to spend our time on is, what are the value props of liquid cooling? Where is the industry going and why are we doing this? So traditionally, this has been an easy sell for HPC. Performance has been the name of the game. We can run very high TDP processors on turbo mode for very long periods of time. But what we talk a lot about today is around efficiency, especially for kind of any CFO or any financial folks in the audience. 
This is all about OPEX. How can we reduce electricity costs throughout the data center every day? And this is really around cooling. When we talk about PUE or power uh, utilization rates, it's all about the energy used against the energy used for compute. And we want those to be as close as possible. And with liquid cooling, we can get very close. Another important element is around density. In kind of the most simple explanation, if we can build more compact racks, higher density, fully populated, we can build smaller data centers overall. That's more of a CapEx story. How can we really build better data centers, lower electricity usage, capture more heat? So the stuff, I, I want to kind of focus on this because we talk a lot about you know, the value props of liquid cooling, but it's nice to show some tangible pictures. What is liquid cooling and what are some of the things to be thinking about, I would say, short term and long term? So on the left are very prevalent technologies today. All of these require facility water, and this is really when we talk about liquid cooling. Liquid to air cooling essentially takes facility water and we create cold air. Similar to data center technologies today, these don't require any special servers, they're air-cooled servers, but we're moving cold air very close to the server. So we're going to talk about each one of these individually. On the far right is fanless direct liquid cooling, all cold plates. This is what we find in the Cray X today, kind of exascale computing, the very highest in energy efficiency, very high TDP processors. In the middle is kind of a hybrid or a mix where we're doing direct liquid cooling on about 70% of the components and then we use air for the rest of the components. We have a tremendous amount of flexibility in what components we choose. And then kind of in the middle here we talk about immersion. This is where servers are fully immersed in a dielectric fluid capturing all of the heat but has its own pros and cons. So quickly on each one, especially if these are kind of newer technologies to you, Rear door heat exchangers are exactly that. They mount on the rear of a rack. They're all about neutralizing the hot air that exits the rack. So if you can see, and you can kind of imagine, the cold aisle infrastructure, the data center is already making cold air. It's being pushed through the front of the racks like normal. For a moment where that red arrow appears, that's the hot air coming out of the servers. It's then immediately neutralized through a rear door. The main value prop for rear door heat exchangers is around reducing the thermal footprint in the data center. So if your data center already has, I would say, tremendous strain on air-cooled infrastructure, cracks or craws um, kind of around the perimeter, this is going to allow you to deploy some of these higher density racks, better energy efficiency, but have very little thermal footprint on the data center. But what it doesn't do is provide inlet air. So you still have to put this in a very standard data center location in order to have uh, liquid cooling. Now arcs is, is, I would say, rear doors to the next level. Arcs, very similar to rear doors, are going to take facility water into a coil. You can kind of see the CFD model at the top here spinning. But unlike a rear door where it only neutralizes the back end, it's also creating cold air on the front. So it is creating cold air, which is getting sucked into the servers, and then it's sucking the hot air back into the back end of the arcs. Also, a highly energy efficient solution. You don't have to worry the same way about kind of perimeter cooling. But another nice thing about this is these can be deployed in very non-typical data center environments. This does not require any air handling outside of these racks. They're completely sealed with acoustic foam, so they're quiet to work beside, but they also capture all of the heat. So when we start talking about direct liquid cooling, how HPE and a lot of the industry deploys these technologies is in these kind of closed loop racks. So you can see this rack itself is completely closed. It contains 25% propylene glycol. Very stable fluid, excellent bioside protection, excellent corrosion protection, but it is kind of one closed loop system. On the bottom is the primary side. So this is what's on the facility side. This is often water. It could be ethylene glycol, but it is most often water. The water from the primary side is pumped from the facility into the bottom, which is a CDU or a coolant distribution unit. Inside of this, and this is, I think, an important concept to kind of always get across is these two fluids never mix. They do interface through a plate-to-plate -plate heat exchanger, so that's where all the heat exchanging happens, but they are completely different fluids. And why this is so important is for kind of some of the points that I had highlighted here was we can rack and roll these solutions. And I think that's one of the kind of big value props that liquid cooling is leaning into kind of in this generation of HPC, enterprise, and exascale is being able to build these systems in a factory fully cable them, fill them with fluid, test them, ship them direct to customers versus us kind of scratch building things on site. That's a trend that I really see is how can we deploy more modular technology that's ready to go. You need to plug in power, networking, and water, and these systems run. 
So the, the direct liquid cooling itself, the image I'm showing here, this is of a, one of the Cray XD servers. It looks very similar for ProLiant liquid cooling. Essentially, the aluminum air heat sinks are no longer used. We're taking these copper cold plates, and I'll show you what a copper cold plate looks like on the inside. But we're putting them right on top of the CPUs and GPUs to capture the majority of the heat. And then sometimes we also have the option for memory cooling. So depending on kind of what the end user is looking for, how much heat capture, in a nutshell, the thermal difference between with memory cooling or without memory cooling can be about 10%. CPU cooling on its own can be about 65% of the total server heat load captured into cold plates. And with memory cooling, we can add about 10 more percent. One of the big things that we always talk about with liquid cooling is it has to be resilient and very easy to use. And so everywhere we use these direct liquid cooling systems, we deploy these dripless quick disconnects. So they can be connected and disconnected with one hand, no drips within the racks, but it allows you to service the servers very easily. So in addition to really just the, the inlet and outlet line, exact same servicing for these servers compared to an air-cooled server, and the tubes are all flexible. So they can be rotated out of the way to access the CPU and GPU and the memory as well. So cold plates itself, this is one of the things I, I like to just show because it really, um, you can all leave here feeling a little bit smarter. You can talk about this at lunch. What's in a direct liquid cooled system? The technology that is, I would say, most prevalently used is called skiving. It sounds like a fancy word. It is essentially, we take a copper block, we take a very sharp blade, and we peel back very thin fins over and over and over again. And it allows us, if you, if you can think of what an air heat sink looks like, the gap between them is quite large. These fins often, we can get about 100 to 150 fins per inch. So they are extremely dense, but it allows us to create a tremendous amount of surface area for the coolant to capture all of the heat. And so this is one of the things I was like talking about. This is what is inside of most liquid cooling systems that uses cold plates. There are other technology vendors that use different stuff, but this is what is inside of the Cray X today, what is inside of Cray XD, and is what inside of ProLiant. So you can kind of talk about that. Skiving, it's a kind of a, a buzzword you can take away today. So immersion, immersion is, is a technology we see a lot of today. One of the big advantages of immersion is it's 100% heat capture. We can fully dunk servers into immersion tanks, capture all the heat. They're also very quiet. So similar to ARCs, it's a really easy system to work alongside. The downside is these are not off the shelf servers. We have to, in every case, customize these servers, take out some components, we can't use spinning disks, we have to look for compatibility within cables, even networking cables, how are these cables gonna live long term, brittleness factors, what is all compatible. So there's a lot more complexity with immersion systems. Today, HPE offers uh, no off-the-shelf immersion systems, but we do have a wonderful OEM group that works directly with customers when they are um, motivated by finding an immersion vendor that they want to work with, we can have kind of that three-legged process to work with our OEM groups to retrofit the servers and work within their immersion environment. But immersion is not one of the technologies that HP offers today. So I'll finish on kind of talking about the stuff on fanless direct liquid cooling. So this is, I think, where a lot of the industry is going. And this is the, the I would say, the holy grail. There are trade-offs in when we work towards fanless direct liquid cooling. Um, this is really wonderful that we have one of these demo systems here. Um, just at the compute area, we have one of our HPC Cray EX systems that is pretty much this exact system. No fans within the system, 200 kilowatt rack densities, very dense, all liquid cooling. Now the Pro is obviously extremely quiet to work alongside. You can have a very normal discussion, power supplies, um, CPU, memory, everything is liquid cooled. It is also very heavy. So that is one of the trade-offs of these systems is as data center operators start designing for liquid cooling, some of the infrastructure becomes a bit heavier. So that's one thing we always have to consider. Um, the other thing is around flexibility in the design. And that's kind of where we'll, we'll jump to with this um, kind of shot here is, as we go towards higher energy efficiency and more liquid cooling, there is often a trade-off with the design parameters. And so for customers that are looking for, I would say, um, kind of fixed design parameters, they know where they're going. They're gonna be designing full racks at a time, rack and roll. Direct liquid cooling works wonderfully because we can do all of the work in advance, have excellent thermal uh, conductivity, and just kind of works really well within the data center. The trade-off though is, 
you need a lot, I would say, less flexibility in picking components and rapidly changing things out. So for example, if you are playing with PCIe cards, different uh, storage form factors, liquid cooling really doesn't work in that, that way that you can swap them all out, have a kind of heterogeneous setup within, within one rack. But it is one of the issues that we continue to explore is where today direct liquid cooling is really a homogeneous environment. Racks are all the same stuff. They're either all compute or they're all accelerator. Uh, they're all one thing or another. But we are starting to see more developments, especially within our groups, of very heterogeneous setups. How can we control flow, thermals, even density within a rack, but with a very different technology? And that's kind of one of the areas I wanted to kind of end on today is, what are we looking towards for the future, for, for liquid cooling across the industry? And these really apply to, again, exascale, enterprise, and everything in between, is customers are very concerned about increasing thermals. You know, I kind of start with the shock and awe at the beginning, 500 watt CPUs, 1000 watt GPUs. Those are quite concerning for sure, especially if kind of your groups are looking to utilize kind of top TDP processors, or even explore some of the, the bottom end stuff 200 watt CPUs are, I think are gonna become table stakes very quickly. And when you fully populate a rack, that's a lot of thermals. We can be playing in the 40 kilowatt space very quickly. And so increasing chip densities are really one of the discussions that we have every day. I would say that the rest of our day today, my day, will be filled with meetings specifically around this. Rising OPEX and CAPEX. This is another one that's really important. OPEX, quite simply, electricity usage. How do we power the fans that are gonna be cooling these 50, 60, 70 kilowatt racks, a little bit easier with liquid cooling, but even CapEx, how are we gonna build these data centers that are quite expensive using very expensive chips in, in, in you know, land is becoming more expensive, especially in, we talk with our friends in Europe, there's not a growing amount of real estate that we can build in. So the name of the game is about kind of capitalizing on what we have, and even in the US, that is becoming, I think, a more prevalent discussion universities, research centers, are not always willing to move to another state so they can just kind of build. They want to work within their existing kind of land leases to see what can we get out of this real estate, but even what are we budgeted for power? That's been an important topic. Maintenance has been a very big discussion. When we start adding liquid cooling to the system, and if you have one rack liquid cooling, quite easy to take care of. What happens when you have 100 liquid cooled racks? Rack density, with the health of the coolant is really important. So how do we take a 25% pro propylene glycol mix and ensure its health over 100 racks in hundreds of gallons of quantities? That's something that we are starting to explore with customers that are entering a liquid cooling space for the first time. Quite honestly, once they kind of cross that barrier, it is something that becomes kind of table stakes. All data centers are building out their planning, their kind of, um, health and safety manuals run, how do we handle liquid cooling, which itself is a kind of an inert, very safe liquid, but still requires kind of a new level of training. And then the other one is lack of infrastructure standards. So when you're gonna buy or build many, many, many racks that are gonna have liquid cooling, and over time you may want to mix kind of different vendors, how are you gonna do that? The one thing I would say with confidence is, vendors will not mix within the rack but vendors will mix within the data center. So you could have OEM vendor one and OEM vendor two having different racks within the data center, but within the rack itself, I foresee no mixing for warranty. The big W, that's gonna be the biggest kind of point we'll see is warranty issues are gonna drive that. And so I'll end on today kind of what customers are gonna require. For those customers that are already using direct liquid cooling, very commonly the temperature of their water is between 17 and 27 Celsius here in the United States. Where customers want to go is beyond 32 Celsius. In Europe, they will, will not answer our bids unless it is 40 Celsius, which is very hot. And the reason for that is energy usage. If we can decrease our reliance on chillers substantially, it makes an enormous difference on our electricity usage and what we can also do for heat reuse. Can we reuse that heat, pump it somewhere else in the building? That's a very interesting use case. More room neutral cooling. How can we ensure that whatever we're adding for more racks in the data center doesn't have a significant impact on the other racks that are there? So when we talk about rear door or arcs, that's kind of the name of the game, ensuring that there's no kind of additional thermal footprint. So I'll kind of end there today. I would love to kind of have any follow-up chats. We're chatting right on the side, um, kind of in our session over here. But if you have any questions, yeah, please follow up. But yeah, thanks for attending the session.